Welcome, friends, to another edition of Ask Prof. Wolf, a program we've developed uh, that allows us and you, the community of folks uh, that we report to and talk to, allows us to communicate in a direct, ongoing, live way, and it allows me to respond to the questions and thoughts and concerns you have, and that's why we do it. So I want to begin by thanking you for being part of it. We're going to start, as we always do, with a couple of questions that have come in since our last session, and then we'll open it up to the questions you want to send in now that our team here is ready to process and deliver to me for my responses. And again, the point and purpose is to respond to the issues of concern in your minds. All right, the first question for today comes from Jolene. And Jolene asks a simple question, but deceptively, as with most simple questions, there's a lot behind it. She asks, what is your opinion of the degrowth movement? Uh, so let me respond. Throughout the history of capitalism, there have been sensitive people who have noticed various kinds of irrationalities, things going on that they understand make no sense or are destructive or are unwanted, and they want to do something about it. It's a good and a positive, and it's a socially responsible impulse that they have, and so they get angry at that particular problem. One of them is the absurd focus on growth, the notion that every economy has to grow. Think about how often on the radio or television each of us hears some announcer say, the GDP grew X percent per year in this place or that country or this period of time, as if a measurement of an economic system reduces to a measurement of how fast it grows. Think also about all the intelligent things that have been said about our economic system overusing the earth, the air, the water, and the purity that nature once gave all of those things. It's our growth that overfills our junkyards, that overexhausts where we dump our excess and our waste. And it has led sensitive, smart people to say, can we stop the growth? Can we slow the growth? Can we have a system, an economy, a society not fetishized around growth? The impulse is good. The idea, smart. But the solution, I don't think so. And let me explain why. Growth is the end result of something else. Basically, you have to ask yourself the question, why is every company, almost without exception, focused on growth? Let's make more profit. Let's take the profit and reinvest it in the company. The answer is not that individuals are born greedy. The answer is that's how the system works. If you make more profit and you use it to get better equipment or to hire more skilled workers or to use better inputs, you'll be more successful than your competitor. And the customers will come to you, not to your competitor. And you will succeed and your competitor will fail. And you don't want to fail. You don't want to be the competitor who fails. So you try to make as much profit as you can and plow it back into your business as much as you can, not because you're greedy, but because that's how you survive in a capitalist economic system. If you make a system work this way, that it rewards those who expand and grow and punishes those who don't, you can hardly be surprised if growth becomes a kind of crazy fetish that invades everybody's consciousness. So my reaction is, I want to say to the degrowth people, you're on to something, but you need to let your brain take you a bit further to understand why growth persists, 
why the efforts to stop growth don't seem to work, why the society as, is as freakishly focused on getting bigger now as it was 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years ago. You have to recognize, as I think we have, that this capitalist system has as one of its many irrationalities growth built in to its way of having folks survive in the core production of goods and services organized as profit-making capitalist enterprises. That's the root of the problem. Let's turn to the next question that we collected over the last time before we open it up to all of you. This question comes from Loretta, and it came quite recently. She wants me to comment on the interview between Tucker Carlson and Russian President Putin. She notes that it provoked a storm of criticism of Putin, but even more of Carlson, and wants to know how we think about that. Okay, let me respond. It's not quite the economic focus that we mostly have, but who knows? It's all connected sooner or later anyway. So let's, let's dive right in. I don't really want to say much about the interview of Mr. Putin in terms of what he said. The truth of it is, what's interesting to me is that if you have been following the war in Ukraine, since its beginning in February of 2022. And if you have exposed yourself, which you could do through the internet, to reports in various parts of the world, not just the United States, you will have known that most of what President Putin told Tucker Carlson about the war in Ukraine is old news. It wasn't really very new. And that's not surprising when a reporter interviews a head of state, you kind of mostly get what the official position of that government is, maybe with a few little nuances or new things woven in, but it's basically you're getting the official line. And more or less, that struck me what Mr. Putin was giving Mr. Carlson. Now, it's true that most Americans do not get that. And the reason for that is something that Mr. Carlson talks about, and he's right. We do not have the kind of free and open press when it comes to these issues that we ought to have. Most Americans have never heard what the Russian position on all of this is. Or if they've heard anything about it, they've heard about it from American news sources that are very hostile to what Mr. Putin and Russia's positions happen to be. So to get it from somebody who believes it, to get it from someone who wants you to believe it, is a new experience for Americans and might be quite shocking. But that's a criticism of American journalism. We should have been reporting their perspective for Americans to think about and listen to and make their own judgments about, alongside of the announcements from Mr. Biden or American officials when they got interviewed about the American position on all of this. We got one, but we didn't get the other until Mr. Carlson broke the taboo, went over there, and asked the usual questions. Some people have attacked Mr. Carlson for not asking awkward questions about things that Russia might be embarrassed or upset about. Okay, he could have done that. Probably not the smartest thing to do uh, for the first time that you have an interview with a head of state. Kind of wait on that. And I can understand you don't want to maybe foreground that kind of stuff. It would be as if in an interview with President Biden, we want, reporters kept asking about the high percentage of black and brown people that fill the jails of the United States and the institutionalized racism we have and the, the children in cages at our borders. You, yeah, you don't want to quite focus on that. You could get to it maybe in the second or third interview, but going after Mr. Carlson on that hmm, strikes me as a kind of cheap shot. I think what was most upsetting to Americans, it's embarrassing for Mr. Carlson to show us Russia 
Moscow, and Mr. Putin. And why is it embarrassing? Because most Americans don't know anything about any of that. And this was a shock of the new. And I believe Mr. Carlson was shocked as well. He said so. Some of you may have seen the interviews Mr. Carlson has given since the interview of, part of Putin in response to the criticisms aimed at him. And there he has shown some very interesting things that I want to end my response with. First, he shows a clip of himself going through a supermarket in Moscow and saying, my God, look at this supermarket. There he is, wheeling a cart through a supermarket. Looks a lot like the supermarkets we all know about. And he's putting bananas and meat wrapped in plastic into his cart, kind of like we're used to doing in most parts of the United States. Why is that shocking? Because Americans somehow didn't understand that in Russia they have supermarkets with carts and aisles of food that you put in your cart. It's as if Americans grew up, and I'm almost quoting Carlson here, living in a world in which America had all these wonderful new and shiny things and the rest of the world didn't. And you know, that's not been true for 50 years. And it's less true with each passing year. There's another clip of Mr. Carson going into a subway in Moscow and seeing that it's beautiful and clean and impeccable. And he's been criticized for that. You should be smart enough to know, one critic said, that in a dictatorial regime like in Russia, they have a few projects they pump money into that look good as if the clean, beautiful subways of Moscow are unique to Moscow and Russia. They're not what the critic doesn't know, but what Carlson now knows is that the subways in Paris are as beautiful as those in Moscow, or nearly so, and that in many countries there are beautiful, clean subways of the sort that make those of us who live in New York and work in the subways here embarrassed about what our country has come to. And that's the thing Mr. Carlson was interested in. And that's, for me, the most important thing about these interviews. Mr. Carlson is a conservative, born in 1969, grew up in an America moving to the right an enthusiast for Trump, an enthusiast for MAGA. But he's beginning to realize, as he said himself, that his beliefs were based on a notion of the United States and the backwardness of the rest of the world that was wrong, that was based on miseducation and misinformation. And he's in the information business. He feels betrayed. He said so. And he thinks maybe he didn't learn the truth about Mr. Putin either, or about Russia, or about fill in the blank. He's a generation of Americans growing up that are beginning to confront the difference between the United States they thought they lived in and the one they actually have. And Carlson, Tucker Carlson said that. I was born in one America, it's gone now. Now we can criticize him about whether it ever existed, but we all agree it isn't what he thought it was. And where is that gonna take Mr. Carlson? How many questions is he gonna ask? How many new things is he gonna think about? The war in Ukraine? Maybe think about it in a different way, Mr. Putin. It's not that those things have to become good and the bad become good and the good become bad. Not at all. It's just a kind of growing up that many generations, my own included, have had to go through. The difference between the rosy picture we painted about our own country relative to the rest of the world and the reality. It hasn't been that way for a long time. And finally, the reality caught up to Mr. Carlson, and it's going to be interesting to see how he develops in that way, and he may become a surprise to all of us where that ends up. Okay, I'm going to turn now to the first of the questions coming in through 
your work and our team processing. Okay, here's the first one from Asmari number one. That's what this person calls themselves. Here's the question. If the U.S. economy is in a process of collapse, why would the stock market be up so much? Is this because in large part due to the financialization of the U.S. economy? What has to happen for the stock market to go down? These are great questions. I'm going to put them together and answer as follows. It is extremely important for all of you to understand that an economy is one thing and the stock market is something else. They're not tied together in any one-to-one -one correspondence. The economy is the production and distribution of goods and services. It's the jobs we all have. It's the goods we and services we all buy to survive, to reproduce ourselves so we can go and do our jobs, etc. The stock market is a place where people and institutions with money buy and sell from each other titles of ownership to the factories and offices and stores where the real economy happens. So here's what's possible. That the people who are buying and selling ownership rights, shares of stock, they're called, bonds, they're called, in the companies that produce and distribute, the people in buying and selling from each other can be in a situation where they bid up the price of each other's ownership rights. I want those stocks, so I'll pay you more than you paid for them to get them. Then the stock market goes up. If the government pumps money into the economy, two things can happen. The money can be used to buy goods and services, more food, more clothing, more shelter. That won't have any impact on the stock market one way or the other. Or the money can go into the stock market. People who get the money in their hands, the new money, can decide not to spend it on food, clothing, and shelter, but instead to buy ownership entitlement, shares of stock. Then the stock market zooms. You've got to keep them separate. Let me give you a historical example before going back to that basic point. We now know, looking back, that the, the period of the late 1920s was a time when the American economy began to overheat, to produce more goods than it could sell, to undertake investment projects that could not work. It was a time of the economy really having a problem. But the stock market was going crazy. It was almost as if the projects in the real economy not working out so well, money moved into the stock market where you could make a profit buying and selling shares more easily than you could make it producing anything. That's the United States. We don't produce much anymore anyway. We've outsourced that. The production happens in, in China, in India, in Brazil, in places like that. Here, we're big on finance. We're buying and selling entitlements, bonds, stocks. And so the stock market can go up, as it did in the late 20s, even though the economy is going into the toilet. Eventually, of course, they catch up. And here's how that catch up works. Suddenly, one day, the people who have been buying shares begin to look over their shoulders. Wow, I'm paying a lot for these shares. I'm hoping I can resell them soon for even more money because that's why I'm here. But let me look back at the companies. My goodness, they're not doing well. My goodness, there are troubles coming. Maybe I should leave well enough alone. I made a, a cool billion. I'm going to get out of the stock market. I'm going to start to sell. I'm not buying anymore. I want to get money because at that point, the stock market crashes. That's what it's called. 
a stock market crash. Suddenly, everybody wants to sell. Nobody wants to buy. As the word begins to spread, uh-oh, other people are getting nervous. I'm going to look at the real economy. It's not looking so good. And then the only question left in the minds of everybody after October of 1929 was how could we have been so blind as to not see what was coming? The American stock market crashed in October of 1929 and took the whole economic system down with it. We had a depression that lasted a decade, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Could that happen again? You bet. We came real close in 2008 and 9, when again, the, not the stock market this time, although it crashed too, but the bond market and the, the devices that have been developed, the credit default swaps and a whole lot of other instruments of finance fell apart because the reality underneath them had already been deteriorating. And they caught up and it crashed and it took the stock market down. So yeah, you can have a declining economy, we do. And one of the reasons I talk about all of the signs of decline is to hope that maybe we can learn from history. I'm not too optimistic about it, but maybe to be a lot more careful not to believe that because the stock market is going up, everything else will be taken care of. Not the way it works. The stock market can take off and the economy can go down. And when that happens, watch out. We are in that situation. We have been. We look like we're about to do it again. And I would warn you, be very careful. Be very, very careful if the stock market is something that tempts or in already engages any of you. The next question from BRB. What do you view as the causes of low national birth rates, especially in Western countries? And do you have suge suggestions for solutions? What are the implications? Really good question. Across the world, from Japan and China to the United States and Western Europe, birth rates are declining. You might put it this way. With few exceptions, Richer countries, countries that are developing their economic systems to bring large numbers of people out of poverty into middle or upper class standards of living, reduce the number of children they decide to have. We have seen that over and over again. Poor people have more children than rich people over and over again. Are there some exceptions? Of course. Here in the United States, we have a strange statistic that it's true. Poor people have most, cho most children. The middle has the fewest. But when you get to the very top, they start having children again because they're very rich and they have people to take care of their children. The reason the vast mass of the middle in our society is not having children is, and I cannot say this politely, so I'm going to say it bluntly, they can't afford it. We have made the relationship between the income a person can earn by working hard and the cost of raising a family impossible for millions of people. They might have, they would have, chosen to have children had the finances been different. There's no way out of that. Are there other factors? Of course there are. But that's for me, and I'm an economist, so I tilt toward these kinds of explanations, I admit that. But even allowing for that, that is the reality. Look, most Americans don't want to be in debt. And most Americans weren't in debt up until the 1970s and 80s the way they are now. So why now are we all carrying the latest numbers, an average of $6,000 of credit card debt per American? Where's it coming from? The answer is simple. 
on the one hand, there's money coming in that you earn from your job, your work. And on the other hand, there's a cost of the so-called American dream that you are looking to enjoy. You want to provide a home. You want to have an automobile. You want to be able to send your kids to college. You want to be able to take part in the activities of the society you're living in. But that costs money. So what happens to people if the money coming in and the cost of what they want to live as a life don't match? What happens if the advertising that you see all day, every day, on TV, on the radio, on the internet, when you go out on the street, tells you, dress like this, have this kind of equipment in your house, go on this vacation, go see this concert, go to this athletic event. You know what they cost. You know what it means. You're being pushed and invited and encouraged to do something you cannot afford. That is very painful. And you know what most Americans do? They blame themselves for this. They don't say, as I want you to say, this is a system that isn't working properly. You gotta give us the income to buy the goods. Otherwise, the system is busted, broken down. No, no. Instead, they say, I didn't work hard enough. I didn't work enough hours. I didn't make an... They blame themselves. Or they begin to do other kinds of things to try to solve this problem. One of them is they borrow money like they never did before, like their parents wouldn't have dared to do, and that their grandparents wouldn't have imagined. They don't want that debt. They don't want the worries that go with a credit card balance, with the car payments due, with the mortgage every month. They don't want it. But what are they going to do? And you know what else they're doing? They're not going to have that many children or maybe any children at all, because it's so expensive. And what have societies done? They've discovered in the craziness of capitalism that if you don't have children, you don't have the next generation of workers. And capitalists need workers, otherwise nothing happens. So how have they solved the problem? In typical capitalist fashion, in an irrational way, immigration. In every part of the world that's rich, they are drawing, surprise, surprise, millions of poor people who want to have an opportunity at a rich life, a job, an income, a home, an automobile, a college education. And they're coming in desperate to get those things. That frightens the American, the people already in the rich car countries like the America, that they may lose their job or they may have a lower income. So you set the immigrant against the people that are already here. Even in the, in the United States, where everybody was an immigrant or the descendant of an immigrant, still you see it. So the immigration provokes more trouble. Capitalism's problems lead them to solutions that are worse than the problems with which they began. And notice in all the discussions of immigration and all the discussions of the declining birth rate, who has the courage to say, if you have an economic system that doesn't pay the mass of people the kinds of incomes they need, they're going to do the borrowing and the cutting back on children and many of the other things that are the normal, natural, predictable responses. Who will dare point the finger at capitalism? It's long overdue. We ought to be doing it now. The next question comes from Cam. One of the main components of the U.S. GDP, which is higher than any other country in the world, and also how far uh, the U.S. economy could go with more than uh, $3 trillion of national 
public debt. Uh, the number three trillion is a mistake. If that's if that's not a misprint, that might just be a misprint. We have over thirty trillion, uh, by the way, just so you all know, uh, in our national debt. Uh, but let me talk to you about uh, GDP. Yes, the United States has a greater GDP than any other country. GDP, again, to make sure we're all on the same page. Gross domestic product. It's a rough measure of the total output of goods and services in a country in a year. And I underscore the word rough. It's not exact, far from it, but it gives you some idea. Okay? Now, let's do a comparison. The United States has a GDP about 21, 22 trillion dollars per year. Very big, very impressive. Russia, I'm going to pick an example because it's in the news to give you an idea. What is Russia's GDP? About one and a half trillion. Let me, let me do that again just to make sure you all get it. Russia's GDP, one and a half, maybe two trillion per year. The United States, 10 times more than. 10 times larger. This is not a, when you think about the war in Ukraine as a proxy between the United States and Russia, it is in many ways that fought at the expense horribly of the Ukrainian people. But it is a war that reminds one of the biblical David and Goliath. And the United States is in the position of Goliath making the outcome of that war perhaps a bit of a surprise, given that. Well, what about Italy? GDP, four trillion. Britain, six to eight. Get the impression? But now comes the one that may surprise you. The People's Republic of China. Yeah, again, there's some debate, 17, 18 way more than any country in Western Europe, way more than Russia, not that much less than the United States, and catching up fast. The GDP is the total amount of goods and services produced. It therefore depends on the total amount of goods and services produced for the public to consume, you, me, the total amount produced for the government, and the total amount produced by businesses for one another, the output of one business being the input of another. When you add up all the outputs for the public, for the business community, and for the government, you get the total output of a society. And how? what determines how much it grows? Well, the answer is how productive the people are. That's a big one. How many people is the society growing? Because remember, growing people means more production if the people have jobs. If the productivity of workers is rising, they're becoming more skilled, more educated, the GDP goes up. If more of the use output of a country is used to improve their technology, to improve the equipment they have to work with, to improve the machinery they work with, well, then that'll grow the GDP too. All of those factors are shaping the world economy. But if what's behind your question, as it often is, is how is it changing? Well, after World War II, the United States was completely dominant. Seventy years ago, the GDP of the United States was an even bigger, much bigger player in the world economy. The last 70 years have seen a relative shrinking of the footprint of the U.S. relative to Europe that recovered, to Japan that recovered, and now in the last 20 years, the Colossus of China, the biggest country in the world by population, among the very poorest, got its act together. Whether you like it or not is another matter. This is not an endorsement of them or a celebration. 
But if 25 years ago you wanted to be the fastest growing economy in the world, to escape poverty and to arrive at a decent standard of living for your people, then the best place you could have lived in was the People's Republic of China. Its growth is unequaled. That's why it's the only country catching up to the United States. And if current rates of growth of GDP are maintained, China will surpass the United States in GDP by the end of this decade that we are living in, in the year 2024. Here's a question from Juan. Juan tells us that he lives in Latin America and concerned, is concerned that his country will ally itself with authoritarian states like Russia, China, and Iran just to escape the U.S. sphere of influence. Do I have any thoughts? Well, thoughts, yeah. Juan, I would tell you your concern is reasonable, logical, and in line with what's happening in history. I think that's what's going to happen. I think more and more countries are doing it. Look, China was in many ways alone 10 or 20 years ago. Then it formed the thing called BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And then a few months ago, another six countries joined the BRICS. Together, the GDP, the gross domestic product of the BRICS countries today, is larger than the total GDP of the United States and its major allies, a group called the G7. The United States, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, and Japan. Those are the two great economic powers in the world economy today. The G7 around the United States and the BRICS around China. One of them is a declining share of total economic wealth, and the other one is a rising share. The G7 share now about 29% of global GDP. The BRICS share, about 32-33%, and the gap is widening. You know what it means? As I've, I believe I've said to you before, every poor country in the world, every poor region that is thinking of borrowing money or getting investments or growing or enhancing its educational system or its medical care system, where are they going to look for help, for loans, for investments? They used to have to go to London, Paris, New York, because that's where all the wealth was. Not anymore. They have an option. They have a choice. They can go to Beijing. They can go to the BRICS. There's even more money there for them to try to persuade, to pitch to. Of course they're going to try. Of course they're going to play these two against each other. Of course, they're going to make deals with the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians and so on. Of course they are. And the country you're concerned about is likely to be among them, if not sooner than later. But let's be clear. Authoritarian is a lovely word, but it applies all over the place. Authoritarian governments are found in the West, plenty of them. Allied with the United States, plenty of them. Allied with the BRICS, yeah, you find them there also. But there is no, no necessity one way or the other. It is true that the Chinese achievement involved an enormous role for the government relative to that role played in the United States, where the government is very strong, but not like in China. True enough. So you got to balance the size of the state issue, raises questions, all legitimate, against the benefit that they got, which is a faster rate of growth. 
the UN reported last year that China has lifted 800 million people within its boundaries out of poverty in the last decade. That's a historically unprecedented achievement for a group of people that is larger than the combined total population of the United States and Western Europe. Okay, you've got to weigh that. You can't pretend that this economic growth and all that it means doesn't count in ascending, uh, uh, thinking about these. So yeah, have every right to worry and be critical of authoritarian governments. But you have to ask the question, what comes with them? What is the price to be paid about them? The next question comes from Joe. What can city and county governments do to promote and grow worker-owned and operated enterprises? Well, there are many things. But rather than go through a list, which you can get from our website, democracyatwork.info, or by going to many institutions like the United States Federation uh, of Worker Co-ops, I want to talk uh, in a general way to give you an answer. Laws, rules, regulations by cities, counties, and states in the United States are constantly supporting and helping business enterprises. They give them subsidies, subsidies to help them go get started. They give them special uh, tax exemptions. They give them low interest rate loans. They make available special courses at local colleges to help train workers for those businesses. They give them privileged access to land or to harbors, all kinds of benefits. And they've been doing that throughout the history of American capitalism. Here's a simple thing every city, town, and state can do or that you can do if you get active. Offer the same benefits to worker co-ops. Say to a worker co-op, you got, want to get going? We will give you the same low interest loan, the same subsidy, the same special access. We will order uh, our equipment from you to give you a, a, a step up. We will help worker co-ops now and in the future in the same way that we helped capitalist enterprises in our past. It's really only a level playing field that worker co-ops need. Give them that and they'll outcompete your capitalist enterprises. And you know why? It's for a simple, logical reason that most of you already understand. A business that is owned and operated by its own workers produces better outcomes. The workers feel an ownership of their enterprise. They're not just coming nine to five, punch the clock, do the job, get out of there. No, no. This is their baby. This is their project. They participate in this business. They share in the profits. They share in the success. It's a wholly different attitude. We know that. If you live in your own home, you have a different feeling about it than if you rent. If you're driving your own automobile, you have a different feeling about it than if you rent. This is not rocket science. Well, it operates with business enterprise. You're leaving the business at the end of the day, and it's a question of whether you flick out the light and close the faucet so there isn't a drip. If it's the, business, if it's the owner's business and you don't like the owner, <laughs> maybe you'll forget, you'll overlook it. But if it's your own business, if it's your own pocket, if it's that of you and your fellow workers together, you'll close the faucet and you'll flick off the light because it's yours and you care about it. Every city and town is in a position to do that, to make a level playing field, to make sure everything offered to business is offered to worker co-ops. 
And here's another thing. Schools, from public schools to universities to trade schools. How about teaching courses in how to form a cooperative business? You know what we do instead? We stop the education of the mass of people so they're only ever workers. And we put the people on top, the uh, executives and all of that, we send them to business school where they can become the top of the, we systematically organize the business so it will not occur to the top to be in a co-op or the bottom to be in a co-op. Well, that ought to be changed. Our young people ought to be taught that co-op is another way of organizing a business. It's another way of living your life. And it ought to be part of the culture and the education of our city. You do that, and the demand for these kinds of businesses will grow like wildfire, and you will have helped get us there. Okay, the next question, Justin. Justin asks, how do we fight corporations in the future if our labor is no longer needed, if we are obsolete given artificial uh, intelligence? Well, even in the most elaborate fantasies about what artificial intelligence can do, pay close attention. There's a lot of uncertainty. It'll take a good bit of time. And there's lots of disagreement on how much labor will be needed even after we install AI-assisted production processes. But the real question is fighting corporations on what we do with the free time that AI makes possible. And let me explain this as I tried to in the past with a simple example. A machine comes in or a technical process, an AI process, that makes it possible for 50 workers in some factory or office or, or store, 50 workers to do the work that used to require 100. Used to be a 100 workers, eight hours a day, working there, and now with this new AI, you get the same output with 50 workers working eight hours a day. What is going to happen? Well, for the capitalist, it's always clear what happens. You bring in the AI, you install it, and you tell 50 of your 100 workers, we don't need you anymore. It's Friday afternoon, this is your last check Take it, have a nice weekend, don't come back here Monday morning. Why would the capitalist do that? Because whatever the AI costs, he knows he's going to save 50 times the salary of each of those 50 workers as money he used to have to give his workers, he doesn't have to give them anymore. And he's going to be ahead. And he's very eager for it. I get that. I understand that. That's why capitalists lay off workers and replace them with machinery or technology whenever they can. But we don't have to do that. We, the society, we, the people, we, the majority, we don't have to do that. Let me give you a very simple alternative that the capitalist will never do, but that we can do. We can say, let's bring in the AI. Let's cut the amount of work in half, but let's not do it by having 100 workers become 50 workers, by firing half the workers. No, 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 no. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to keep all 100 workers. We're going to pay them exactly what we paid them before, but instead of eight hours a day, they're only going to have to work four. Wow. How's that going to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Working half time, they can get just as much done as before took eight hours because they have the AI. And you know what that means? It means that we can install AI and the benefit is we keep our jobs, we keep our income, and we enjoy a 50% deduction in our workload. 
We have four hours a day to develop our skills, to develop our relationships with our spouses and our children and our friends, and we can become community activists and artists, and wow, we can do a benefit. And we don't have to worry about our jobs, do we? Do the arithmetic with my example. Not the slightest problem. So it's not a question of AI, is it? The AI is good. It's how we use it, either for the profit of the few, that's how we do it normally, or for the leisure of the many, which is how we ought to do it, and which, how, which is how, in a socialist society worthy of the name, it would be done. You'd welcome the technology because it liberates our time, and it liberates the time of the mass of people, the working class, which is a much greater achievement than improving the profits of the owning class, which is a tiny one to three percent of the population. Now here's a question that is a little narrow, but we don't have rules, so let me try it. It comes from THOS, which I think is a shortcut for Theodore, but sometimes might mean something else. Who are the most important Marxian economists that have influenced you? Well, I'll mention those because there are quite a few. Let me start, though, uh, and I don't mean to be flippant, but let me start with Karl Marx, uh, the guy who started it all. Let me assure you that it is worth reading Karl Marx. Yeah, he writes in an old 19th century style. He was originally German, but he lived most of his adult life in England, and so he became very fluent in English and, and, and could think and write in English too. So this is not foreign in that sense. Everything of Marx's, or nearly everything, is now translated and readily available. And yeah, it'll take some use to getting used to, but there's nothing like going to the original. Then you don't have to take anyone's word. You can form your own sense of what the value of this kind of thinking is. And you don't have to worry about this or that argument. It's a way of, of it, learning from how he asked questions. And let me assure you, Marx was a student of the great tradition of German philosophy that goes back to Immanuel Kant and Fichte and Schelling and Hegel, the great names of German philosophy. He is their student. He brings you to that. And he's also, because he was a very serious student, a student of British, English, economics. I mean, Karl Marx's notebooks, which are available on the writings of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, are among the most detailed criticisms of conventional economics that you're ever going to see. There's a three-volume work of Marx's called Theories of Surplus Value that are his notebook about Smith, Ricardo, and a whole host of other well-known conventional economists. Here is a man writing who knows what he's critical of. And finally, he was a student of the French Revolution, of Robespierre and Danton, of the great thinkers who go before them, Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau. Marx is a coming together of the greatest traditions of German, French, and English thought, devoted to a single focus once he was an adult. And here's the focus. What's wrong with capitalism that we can change to give us a better system? It wasn't a cheap shot. He understood that capitalism was an important improvement on what had gone before. He celebrates in capitalism how it went beyond the feudalism 
it replaced. This is no Monday morning quarterback. He understands the, the struggle to go beyond, to make a revolution to a new and better society. Slaves did it to end slavery. Serfs did it to end feudalism. And Marx's work shows us how the working class can and should do it now to get us beyond capitalism. And then to have to give you some names of the people who really took that work further in the 20th and now into the 21st century. And remember, Marx died only 150 years ago, and it, these are the people whose names I'm about to give you that have really carried that forward. In Britain, it's very easy to give you the number one name of the person who took it further. Maurice, although he preferred to pronounce that French name, Maurice, in the English fashion, but his last name was Dobb, D-O-B-B, -B, Maurice Dobb. The greatest of, he wrote many books, they're all available, but the greatest of them, studies in the development of capitalism. How Marx teaches us to understand capitalism's development in such a way as to allow us to take it further. Maurice Dobb also has one of the best books analyzing the economic system of the Soviet Union that you'll ever find. Here's a name you may have heard of, but you may be surprised, because he did important work, too, in intellect in theory of Marxism, is the Russian revolutionary leader, Leon Trotsky. His history of the Russian Revolution, one of the best you'll ever get to understand what that revolution was about. His theory of art and revolution, of the permanence of revolution within capitalism are major, major achievements, okay? In Germany, there was, has been a whole tradition of developing Marx's theories in economics and beyond. I'm gonna mention one school. The school is known as the Frankfurt School because it had its home uh, at the University of Frankfurt in Germany. Frankfurt is a major financial uh, center in Germany and has been. And the names, for those of you that might be interested in following, perhaps the most important thinker there, Theodore Adorno, A-D-O-R-N-O. -O. Names that you are perhaps more familiar with. Walter Benjamin, one of the great Marxist critics of the arts. and many, many more that I don't have the time to go through. In France, Jean-Paul Sartre, a name many Americans know, a serious student and critic of Marxism. The French philosopher Louis Althusser, let me spell that for you because in many ways he's the best, A-L-T-H-U-S-S-E-R, Louis, L-O-U-I-S, Althusser, and again, many more. There are journals you can look at. The British journal, Past and Present. The British journal, New Left Review. The French journal, Temps Moderne, Modern Times. The German school, Das Argument, the argument in German. I could go on and on. In Italy, the works of the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, all of these have been very important influences. The Hungarian philosopher, who was also an economist, Georg Lukács, L-U-K-A-C-S. I could go on, but let me assure you, the literature of Marxism is enormous. Marxism has spread to every country on this planet. And in 150 years, that's an amazing achievement. 
cannot be said about many other schools of thought. It's everywhere. And it's in the United States as well. But it's a school you can learn from if only you give yourself the chance to read it, to think about it, and to get together with others to talk about it. I never had the teachers in the American universities that I went to because they were afraid. We had to learn it on our own as students, but we did. As many students over many generations have done, you can do it too. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you as always. This is a pleasure for me. I hope it's of interest and valuable to you. And we will see you again when we have this program two weeks from tonight, Wednesday, March 6th of this year. Thank you.